And it's my honor today to introduce Stephanie Pollard. Uh, she's a partner at SoftTech PC. SoftTech PC is an early stage micro venture capital firm, and they focus on uh, seed stage enterprise and consumer technology companies. She serves on the board for Envoy, Spoon University, Chariot, Fatherly, and Innocence. Please give Stephanie a warm welcome to our Pride event. Great to be here. Thanks all for coming out. Um, so I have three or four very quick slides to give you context about me and the firm, and then we can go right into questions. So, all right, here we go. So, a little bit about me, in addition to the boards that Rich kindly mentioned, you know, my background is a mix of marketing and technology. I started my career as a technology consultant. Um, I spent a number of years in marketing, and I joined SoftTech about five years ago. I spent the first decade of my career in New York City, and I've been in the Valley for now five years. So if you've got questions about geography, I love answering those questions. Um, in addition to the boards that I'm on, I do a lot of investing in marketplaces, in consumer health, in education technology, and SaaS companies, particularly those around sales and marketing tools, given in my background. All right, so a little bit about SoftTech that I think is always helpful. What is a micro VC firm? Well, at SoftTech, we are currently investing out of our fourth fund. It's an $85 million fund. We have four funds in the firm, um, and they're, you know, it, you know, got historic funds that we kind of continue to invest in existing companies, and then we currently are investing out of this eighty-five million dollar vehicle. Um, we have invested in it's probably closer to one hundred and eighty startups in the almost twelve years that SoftTech has been in business. Our companies have raised over two billion dollars in follow-on considerations. Um, our companies have exited for over. $2.5 billion in M&A, and we had our first IPO this year with Fitbit, and I'm sure there's a handful of at least Fitbit users in the room. Um, what do we do out of the fund, and who do we typically invest in once the profile? So we're investing in about 45 companies per fund, which averages out to be about 14 to 15 deals per year. And I'm typically writing a check that's a minimum of half a million dollars, but could easily go up to a million, a million point two in a seed round. And usually those seed rounds are a million and a half to three million dollars. So I'm not a pre-seed investor. I don't write, you know, a couple hundred K or 50, 100 K checks here and there. I'm writing much more substantial checks and taking in boards in about a third of the companies that I'm investing in, and that's true across the firm. Um, we target ownership. We care about owning a good chunk of your company because we do spend a lot of time with our, with our investments. So we try to own seven to 10% of a company when we invest. In terms of geography, we have pretty much four main geographies that we're looking at. Uh, primarily, Silicon Valley and San Francisco makes up about 75% of our investments. About 10 to 15% are based on the East Coast, and those are really New York City with a tiny bit in Boston and you know that one Philadelphia company that we sort of bump into New York. And then we have a tiny bit in, in, in LA. And then we've actually had a lot of luck over the last several years investing in Canada, specifically in that Waterloo to Toronto corridor. Um, great engineers and great companies coming out of there. And my final point, when we invest, we always invest with a syndicate. We're never the only one writing the check. So when we invest, we invest in three main things. We like our three asses rule. We invest in smart ass teams, building kick-ass products and big-ass pockets. And finally, I'll just leave up our logos. These are just some of the companies that we've invested in over the last almost 12 years. And with that, I'd love to open it up to questions. Sure. I, think, I think people are supposed to come up to the mic. I'm sorry. I if, you, if you like to ask questions, please come up here. Hi, my name is Adrian Gillette. Um, I see that you, you listed the, uh, the geos. Uh, the major metropolitan areas. I'm based in Phoenix, which is, I know, very dry in yep. many respects. But so, are, are there still opportunities for somebody that's working on, on an idea that I think is, meets that criteria, the, the, the three big asses? Yeah, so, um, yeah. yeah. so geography. So why, maybe I'll end first, why don't we invest outside of these geographies? At, at seed stage, um, we're a generalist firm. There's a lot of logos across a lot of very different types of companies up here. We kind of have to filter it down in some way. So geography is one of the ways in which we filter through the thousands of opportunities we see here. We get pretty hands-on with our companies. 
And so there's two things that we need. We need to make sure that we can spend the right amount of quality time with the CEO and with founding team. Much easier to do when they're based locally and you're based locally. Uh, one of the reasons New York works really well for us is I actually am on a plane every six to eight weeks for a week at a time, spending time on the ground in New York. And when we invest, we know really strong investors on the ground in New York. And we have an ecosystem. We have more than one company there. So even though I'm not there all the time, they're not alone. The challenge for us in investing in Phoenix, or Chicago, or Austin, or Atlanta, um, or any number of other companies kind of across the country is, is simply we don't have that network on the ground um, that we know and we trust. And we also don't have other founders on the ground that we know and we trust. So we don't feel we can support you properly. So I would say, you know, look for someone local. Um, and you may have more success with an angel or two that are more institutionalized fund investing in this market. But we'll say the good news is, you know, it takes potentially less capital to launch a company in a market that's not a major market because it's a little cheaper to hire people, right? There's a lot of advantage there. So you might be able to get the company to a point in interesting revenue where, you know, an investor that only does one or two deals a year might be more than happy to get on a plane to Phoenix, right? Whereas for me, it's a little harder with the volume of deals that I'm doing. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Hi, my name's Gavin. Um, when you're looking at the financials of a company that you're going to invest in, how many years ahead do you want to look, see a projection, and what are the sort of numbers that you're looking for? What, what, what do you consider investable? I'm, I'm, I'm investing in seed stage. Do my companies have financials at the stage? So, look, the reality is um, most of the companies we're investing in have a, maybe they have a tiny bit of revenue. Some of them are pre-revenue. We make the assumption, though, that all of these companies will earn revenue at some point, and we, we need to see a clear, principal revenue model. Um, at seed stage, I'm a lot less interested in looking at your five to 10 year projections. Uh, it's really important for me to understand what your operating plan for the next 18 to 24 months looks like because that's when I'm putting money in. So I'd like to get generally a good idea of what your burn rate looks like over that period of time, the key hires that you're gonna make, what you plan to spend on marketing, and then almost like zero out the revenue numbers, assuming no revenue, because in many cases you're actually not making any Beginning. Um, the next thing I'm thinking about, and the things that we generally talk about, maybe you have a looser plan around it, which is not the operating plan, but you know, how do you get to a million in revenue? How do you get to five or ten million in revenue? And what does it take to get to the fifty or hundred million dollar mark? How many years can that be achieved in, roughly? How many how many users might that be? How many customers might that be? But I know it's fiction. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Anna from uh, Blackbox. So I've heard a lot of investors talk about sustainable business models rather than uh, uh, unicorns. So uh, are you also thinking about uh, investing in more sustainable businesses rather than uh, not? And how do you look yeah, at that? That's a great question. So I mean, unicorn meaning a billion dollar company that has, does not justify that billion dollar valuation and maybe has no revenue yet. Yeah, we don't invest in a lot of those things. I can say very happily, we comfortably decided to shift away from investing in companies where we didn't see a clear revenue model a few years ago. The last time we've done sort of one of those free revenue, no idea how we're going to make money deals, probably about three or four years ago. So we definitely very much think about the fundamentals of revenue. When you, when you invest in SaaS, and a good about 50% of our portfolio is SaaS businesses, we are looking at revenue from day one. So a lot of the companies that we're investing in are coming in doing 10 or 20K or maybe 30 or 40K in MRR before we even put any money in. So yes, I mean, we, we are looking at sustainability. At the same time, we expect capital to fuel growth. So we're not looking for companies that are going to raise money once and then you know, get to break even and build a really nice business for yourself and maybe for angels. We're looking for venture size. Well, maybe a follow up. Have you seen valuations go down in the recent? Uh... Yeah, I mean, we're certainly starting to feel a little bit more pressure. Um, and I think, I think that's a good thing. You know, the reality is we're entering into a market where investors at all stages are going to be a little bit more sensitive to pricing. And remember, every time you take on capital, you kind of are going into a contract with an investor that you're going to return some money for the, the, the money effectively that you're, you're borrowing to build the business. So it's a lot easier to get a multiple um, on an investment if the investment is slightly smaller. You're, you're, at the end of the day, you're about growing a big pie. You want to get that pie as big as possible. Fighting over you know, nuances in, in what the valuation is can sometimes not actually be the best case of anybody. Well, 
Hi Stephanie, my name is Ina and my question is how early do you start tracking companies and how long do you know them for usually before you, how, how you do build relationships for you invest in what's the best way for, uh, where do you look for those companies? Great, okay, so uh, where do we, where, how long do you track companies for, how do we get to know them and what's the best way for someone to get to know us? Okay, so I'll try to answer all three. Um, how do we track companies? Well, a lot of the companies that we're investing in, frankly, are kind of under the radar, off the grid. They may not be, maybe they have a public product, but they're still relatively small. So 99.9% .9 of what we look at, and pretty much 100% of what we invest in, comes from introductions to the network. So because you're typically going to be raising, let's say maybe whether it's $100,000 or $500,000 before you're really ready for that multi-million dollar seed round, most likely you've raised some money from an angel or two. And so a great source of capital, a great source of introductions for us is through people that have already invested in you or who are, who are advising you. And I think that, you know, so surrounding yourself by great advisors or great angel investors is a really good way. Um, now, as to how long we get to know a company, that really varies. There are some times where we'll meet a company, you know, the rare, the rare case where we do a company coming out of an accelerator program, you know, maybe we've gotten to know them over the course of a, couple, a month or so because things move really rapidly. Um, there are other deals where we've gotten to know founders for well over a year before we've actually made the investment. I think the tricky part is, is to make sure that if you, uh, let's say, I mentioned this, let's say you raised a million and a half dollars already and now you come back for another million dollars from us down the road. That's probably not something we're interested in investing. It's a little, you raised a little too much capital for it to make sense for us to get involved. Hi there, my name is Kayla Matthews, and I'm the founder of an early stage hardware company. So really exciting to see that there's a lot of hardware. Of both hardware and software, and very curious how you guys approach hardware any differently to software investing, and when you apply it to that three assets rule, are there any key differences or metrics? That's a great question, and there are a lot of differences when you're investing in hardware. Uh, first and foremost, our hardware companies, instead of raising, call it one and a half to two, and maybe three million dollars, I'd say easily those companies are targeting three to four million dollars out of the gate for a seed for a seed for a seed stage investment. So it's we know it's going to take you a lot more capital to get to market. Um, number two, with hardware companies, um, we're even more critical about the technical talent on that founding team. We really need to understand that you have the right core group of engineers um, in order to bring a technical product to market. Um, and so it's really, really critical that you have bench talent that understands that. And then with hardware, I'd say the third thing is we don't usually get to invest in a hardware company that's live and launched in the market, right? It takes you several years potentially to bring a product to market. So our expectation with a hardware company is that we're going to invest in probably some type of working prototype. It's usually fairly rudimentary. Um, but you have not gone into contract manufacturing yet. Uh, you most likely have not gone through pre-sales yet. And part of what you'll use that seed round to do is to get to the point where you're almost ready to launch a product. Um, and so, you know, again, it varies from company to company, but I would say we almost expect our hardware companies to be earlier than our, you know, our, our non-hardware companies, and that's why they raise more money. Got it. And quick follow up, you kind of alluded to that, but how does Kickstarter and other crowdfunding campaigns play into this launching the market? Is that something you like to see? You seem to say, okay, it's okay if it's beforehand, although I know a lot of hardware yep. companies and talking to founders where it's really hard to get investment before you've got that early traction. Right? It is hard. So right. it's a little bit of a catch And there's just like chicken and egg yeah. problem with these crowdfunding campaigns because they can be a fantastic signal if you sell millions of dollars worth of product. Um, but if we look at the numbers and we're like, well, it doesn't really look like there was that much interest in that crowdfunding campaign, and you know, you probably didn't have the marketing dollars to juice it and everything else. So it can be a double-edged sword, I would say. Um, I certainly think it's really nice for you to have some level of crowdfunded uh, traction. It doesn't necessarily have to be for the main product that you're launching. It might be for something else. You really, what you're trying to do it, with any company is you're trying to demonstrate there is a market for the product. And there is an active and engaged community out there that's excited to use the product. But yeah, for August, for, for Fitbit, for all of these companies, uh, all of the pre-sales happened after we made our investments. Yeah. Hi. Hi. 
I'm an award-winning inventor. I was on Jay Leno, the first person in, in the USA to promote the electronic cigarette before it came out. Uh, long story, I can keep going on and on. Will you invest in companies that have diverse products, or are you just looking for just a one product company? I, I believe in continuous innovation. As you know, if you don't develop new products, you're not going to be in business forever. If Apple stopped, where would they be? You know? Sure, we, we obviously, when we invest in particularly the physical product hardware companies, we're not looking for it to be a single product over, over the life cycle of the company. I think Fitbit's a prime example of our thesis around hardware, which is you're going to go to market with a first product. You're going to get to understand your market even better. You're going to now begin to launch products at different price points yeah, to different exactly. consumers, but there needs to be some consistency. We, we don't invest in kind of like the pure play invention type of companies where we're going to ideate, come up with an idea and spit it out like a generator and not leverage an existing customer base. I got you. Now, if you just have a patent application or a prototype or a virtual prototype, is that enough, or do you need a finished manufactured product? As I said earlier, you know, most of our companies don't have a product physically in the market. Um, the patents alone aren't necessarily enough to get us excited. We do like to see prototypes, but really, what we want to understand is that it. You know, and the, the most all of our hardware companies are also software enabled hardware companies, right? So we want to understand that there's a bigger business model generally beyond just. The so it doesn't have to be a wor working finished. Product. A working prototype is usually That's good. Okay. Yeah. Well, I filed a patent application on something like Fitbit before it came out. We should talk. <laughs> Hello, I'd like to ask about travel industry. So, um, my company is a travel tech company, but uh, we spoke with a few investors. They have concerns about travel tech. So, is that I, right? uh, they have some concerns. I mean, they are cautious about uh -huh. this. So I'd like to know uh, what is your take on travel tech industry and travel industry. In, yeah, okay, in, so the question is, um, do I have concerns about investing in travel industry? Um, I'm an avid traveler. I love travel personally. I don't invest in travel. Um, and we as a firm, we don't invest in travel. There's certain categories that for whatever reason, you know, you might have an investor and they just have a distaste for investing in a category. For us, travel is one of those categories where we see it's really, really crowded. We see it's kind of a race to the bottom of margins. Um, we see it's really easy to enter the market, and so it's very hard for us to see kind of another billion dollar company emerging travel. I'm not saying it can't happen, but it's just an area that we happen to struggle with. Where I think a firm like mine is more likely to invest in travel is maybe some sort of B2B type of play, software maybe to replace some of the legacy software potentially used in hospitality, but even then it's still could go be a stretch for us. Uh, my name is Richard, I'm the CEO of a uh, startup in Tampa, Florida, and uh, we've been for the last two, three years building a software platform for uh, small businesses to use for marketing purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, we actually had just launched a product back two, three months ago. We've seen tremendous traction in our hometown. Um, that's why also we're here now to try to find out, you know, how we take it to the next stage. Um, so I guess my question is, as a venture capitalist, would you be looking at companies that are, uh, you know, built the system outside of uh, here and um, proved it outside of here, or before coming here and actually start rolling it out to, you know, California, or would you wait to have somebody in your backyard establish, an, you know, client base, establish an office, a team, uh, before you actually take them, you know, seriously? Okay, so... Again, Florida is one of those geographies that are tough for us. Um, so Indeed, there's stuff for everyone. Tough for a lot of Especially people. startups. Tough for a lot of people. It's ridiculous. Right. Well, you guys have good weather. So, um, and if we succeed there, I guarantee you will succeed anywhere. Yeah, That's yeah. The thing with no, and like, look, you know, again, amazing companies can be built anywhere. It's really hard as an early stage investor to give you the right amount of support in a geography where we don't have that support network. And so for us, it's very important that we have the company that found you here. I do want to pull out a piece of your question though that I think is relevant to you and to the audience as a in general, which is if I'm building more of a locally based, a local customer, local business product, do I need to be live in your market in order to do the investment? My answer would be no. Um, I actually think, you know, for a lot of founders, if you're based in San Francisco, certainly you're going to test your product out in San Francisco. But everybody is testing their product out in San Francisco. Getting traction in other markets, getting traction in what people sometimes refer to as flyover states, getting traction in places where maybe there's some bias in Silicon Valley that, oh, people might not get in a stranger's car to get a ride, 
you know, in a in the middle of the country, that can be a great proof point for the business. So I would not look at traction in a market outside of San Francisco or the Bay Area as being a negative for the company. The question is, you know, are you able to build the company to the scale, hire the talent that you want to hire in your home market, or do you need to be based elsewhere? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Hi, Stephanie. Uh, this is Yan from Trados. Uh, we are from Toronto. We're building a platform for the small business to manage their uh, the clients, uh, manage their suppliers. And also, uh, it's a link to client and suppliers like social networks. And uh, 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 I'd like to know, ask the question, how you evaluate the marketplace uh, you, during your investment process? The market, like a marketplace company? Yeah, marketplace companies, yes. Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I invest in a lot of marketplaces. Um, usually, I don't think I've ever, yeah, I've never invested in a pre-launch marketplace. Um, typically, you want to have some level of traction on both the supply and the demand side for a marketplace. Um, usually, it's easier to get one side than the other. So, the key is really figuring out what's the more difficult side to bring on board and how do you really begin to unlock that. Um, one of the most important things that I look for in a marketplace company, um, in addition to you know where are they in terms of GMV right now, what, what are the, what's their take or their rate from the marketplace, is repeat transactions. And am I coming back to the marketplace to transact with the same individual, or am I getting it? Is there a network effect to the marketplace where the more suppliers on the marketplace, the more benefit I have, and I'm actually interacting with more and more individuals, and that prevents me from going around the marketplace. So I like to look for that repeat behavior, interacting with different suppliers in the marketplace. I think we fit you the requirement very well. We can talk Great. after that. Thank you very much. Good luck. Hi, I'm Bill. I was um, going to ask a question about market traction with respect to OEMs and if that helps or hurts, you know, getting investment down the road. Um, well, do you want to give you a little bit more detail there? Well, if your product is adopted by, you know, let's say a top five in the market, what is that? What is that dynamic? Do right, okay. further yeah, I mean, the question is, are you heavily reliant on one single OEM, or are you working? Are you, you know, and, and what? How does that limit your ability to grow? Um, at Softec, we generally don't invest in businesses like that. We're typically looking at uh, kind of standalone businesses that aren't necessarily reliant on a single supplier to bring them to market. Um, but again, you know, for the right type of investor, that might actually be very interesting. But the question is, is there over reliance on one? And is there any sort of um, limitation to who else you can work with, or are you locked in from a contractual standpoint? Hi, Stephanie. So first, thanks for sharing your time today. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm the Shanghai Chapter Director. I'm also running a uh, B2B marketplace for IoT, uh, industrial IoT technologies. Mm -hmm. um, so you've had great success with Fitbit. I'm curious in the IoT space, are there other uh, industry verticals, technology horizontals, business models that you find particularly uh, attractive right now? And how are you assessing this? Yeah, so we actually have done quite a few hardware investments in the last year, but a lot of those are stealth, which is why those logos aren't up on the screen. Um, we still continue to think there's really interesting um, opportunities out there to invest in, in kind of consumer related hardware technologies. August was certainly our first foray into um, you know automating the home. I think we're continuing to look at opportunities around home automation and what can be done there. Um, in terms of wearables, I think we are definitely interested in things related to maybe more and more on the health spectrum. So you know we've done something in movement and fitness. Um, one of our one of our startups is a company called Six Sensor Labs. They do a gluten, uh, gluten uh, monitor, and they will get into other allergens. So I think we're very interested in things like that. Um, the other piece that we haven't done as much investing in yet, and I think we're just starting to see more of these companies begin to come to market, is in more B2B hardware, right? And using connected devices out in the field. Uh, I think you know we've seen, obviously, a, a, a move towards using mobile with, with field workers and field sales and things like that. And so I think we'll look more and more at applications of hardware, whether that's safer lifting on a factory floor, we've met a number of companies kind of in and around that space, um, whether it's something that's being used in a doctor's office, um, interacting with patients. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think we still see tremendous opportunity. There's tons and tons of verticals. Yeah, really nice. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Jessica. I'm 
Maira Asansa from Fox TV. Uh, do you have any programs specifically for uh, sports content in Spanish for the like, Hispanic community? Do you have any interest in that? In that okay, for, 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 for that again? Uh, any interest in sports uh, content? We are uh, um, an app that is pretty much a TV channel in Spanish for okay. sports. Do you have any? Interest? Yeah, so we actually. The last time we did an investment in sports space, we invested in a company called Bleacher Report, which we sold to Turner Networks. Um, we sold that one to Turner Networks a few years ago. Um, I right now have two companies in the media space. Neither one of them are in, in sports per se. Uh, the question is always, is it really a truly unique opportunity, unique niche? Is there something that's very interesting about the business model that is potentially different from what else is out there? Like one of my... Uh, more unusual media deals is a company called Spoon University, and Spoon University scales through a very distributed network of writers on college campuses. So that's that's kind of the unique twist there, and they leverage the technology platform that they've built in order to do that. So that would be the question with, with any with any media business: is what side of the unique special sauce underlying it that makes it actually scalable as opposed to traditional media? So let's definitely answer our last question. Do you have any final words? So I guess the final words would be, you know, if you're building a company, keep on going. It's never going to be an easy journey. Uh, my biggest piece of advice for when you want to get to know investors for your companies is to get an introduction. Uh, it, you know, I, I pulled the numbers the other day uh, for the deals that we look at at SoftTech. And in any given year, we see about two to 3,000 opportunities uh, 50 of those opportunities get to due diligence a year. That means, you know, we're talking to your references, we're talking to your customers, you've met the entire investment team, you've pitched everybody. 15 of those companies get an investment. So how do you break through that noise? You break through that noise by great metrics and by an introduction by from someone who really knows the VC well, who can vouch for you and who can also vouch for that VC. So best of luck and... Uh, Enjoy the rest of the Thank you, Stephanie. Please give Stephanie a big hand.